right, you guys. Um, today's topic is going to be a little heady, so we're just going to jump right into it. Uh, we're going to be talking about Jainism. Uh, Jainism is one of the oldest recorded religions uh, that we know of. Um, it's related, somewhat related to like Hinduism and Buddhism. It came out of India, I want to say like 3000, 4000 BC. Um, but we're not going to get into like its history or its like religion uh, or its like ideas of like karma so much in this um, in this show. Today we're going to be talking more so about philosophy and epistemology, um, <clears throat> which is like um, the nature of knowledge and how how it's valid and how you know what you know and stuff like that. Um, specifically, I'm going to be giving you a tool that'll help you um, evaluate your beliefs. Um, but we'll talk about that later. You'll see that. It'll come up. Um, so a lot of this information I'm pulling straight out of this book. Um, I think I got it on Amazon. I'm pretty sure you can find it on Amazon. Um, but it's literally... Okay, so this video is probably going to be about an hour long or so. I'll try to cut it down to fat. Um, but all this information is literally like one half of one chapter in this book. So I definitely recommend it if you're interested in the religion itself. Um, it's not, it's very small. Uh, the section is about um, their actual like religion. And I can't really comment on its veracity. Because this guy was a, a, a Spaniard scholar. And this text was then translated into English. So I can't really tell you how accurate it may be. Um, but I did I did manage to find one or two really useful things out of here. So we'll get into that. Um, we'll talk about their epistemology. Um, so Jaynes believed that knowledge wasn't valuable in and of itself. Um, it's uh, unlike a lot of like Western philosophy where it's like to know is divine in its own self. Um, uh, Jains were a lot more practical with their knowledge. Um, they thought that good knowledge must allow us to discriminate between uh, good and bad, quote unquote, uh, what helps us on the path to emancipation. And we'll get into what that means. That's basically the same thing as like getting into heaven or nirvana or stuff like that. Um, so knowledge, knowledge is value is not in how we perceive the world and getting like the most correct perception it's more so about like how we can grow spiritually um they don't place much emphasis on names and forms uh really dead so as long as you understand the underlying meaning of those names that's what really matters more so than studying terminology so you'll see a lot of um like terms like this, where they're italicized. And these are all going to be, I believe, like the Sanskrit terms that um, the same language that the Jains used back then. But it's not really going to matter as long as you understand uh, what we're actually talking about. So I, I try to put both of them next to each other uh, so you can get both of them. But yeah. Um, so Jains that knowledge itself reveals our soul as the subject that knows the world as the object that is known. So unlike certain schools like Buddhism, who say that like all is illusion, um, Jains believed in total realism. There's a knower subject and a known object. Um, so that's undeniable. Um, however, this knowledge can be correct or distorted. Um, and they also believe that um, perfect knowledge is self-revealing, re self both in that the knowledge reveals itself as perfect, as well as reveals the nature of the self in relation to the knowledge. So when, you, uh, when you're cleansed by personal purification or master teachings, consciousness reveals the nature of reality. So knowledge, they say, like they say, knowledge is power. Knowledge is freedom. <sighs> That's what it actually uh, should mean. 
um, knowledge is of maximum importance in achieving nirvana. Uh, like I said, perfect knowledge is self-revealing. Um, so, not like I said, knowledge is a very practical tool for them, which is important. Uh, their philosophy, uh, like most philosophies, their key question is, what is reality? Uh, their ultimate goal is for liberating metaphysical knowledge. Uh, in order to be liberated, you have to be aware of your own conditions and aware of the nature of your surroundings, according to them. Uh, they're also mostly a non-theistic, at least... Uh, Okay, so most of this information is probably going to be somewhat incorrect, um, but it's 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 more so about like what's what's behind the information if that makes sense. Um, so whether or not Jains are actually non-theistic, this is an important point to make. If they were non-theistic, um, they couldn't fall back on faith or divine grace, so they had to rely on their own methodologies, their own logic, their own um, endeavors for uh, development. So they thought um, appealing for virtuous conduct would not be viable unless doctrines could be logically defended. Basically that means uh, more as like if you were to go to an, your average like fundamental Christian and they say no, um, <clears throat> be good because uh, Jesus wants you to get into heaven and he loves you. Like, that's, it's not, it, it wouldn't be viable to a Jain. That's not enough. That's not good enough. Um, support either to say that what your belief of what is good is good or that um, you should be doing that. Whatever they think being good is. Um,. So ultimately, their goal is with knowledge is to eliminate ignorance and acquire wisdom concerning what is actually beneficial, achieving liberation. So every uh, knowledge, every belief they have is supposed to um, help them get closer to liberation. Uh, they also said that abstract logic detached from transpersonal experience is a blind and useless tool. Um, so this is... Um, I'm gonna bring up atheists. Uh, <laughs> I like to rag on them a lot because uh, I used to be like a really hardcore. Like I read Richard Dawkins and all that <sighs> back in like middle school when I was trying to be edgy. <laughs> Funny, um, but <clears throat> ultimately, in atheist logic. It helps them in no way spiritually because they don't even believe in spirit. Um, so it's it's completely useless to a chain. There's there's no reason to uh, ascribe to um, like uh, materialism, atomism in the way that uh, atheists tend to do. Um, so they established five types of valid knowledge. Um, there's a mediated uh, knowledge, indirect. This is usually what we would typically understand as knowledge. Uh, Complemented by memory and, ses and senses. I think this can be um, like memory and um, facts and stuff like that. Um, so it can be valid or erroneous. Um, effective and practical again and again valid means effective in practical terms which means it just enables you to do good and avoid wrongdoing avoid uh, sinning oh, uh, and I hesitate to say that but it's essentially the same thing um, so the first one is uh, sensory perception or deductive reasoning, ordinary knowledge gained through one's senses, experiences, and personal thought. Things like memory, induction, analogy, recognition. Now off the bat, this is probably 90% of what you would, what most people would consider knowledge anyways. Um, and there's four other types. Uh, the second one is knowledge achieved through uh, 
words, number signs, symbols, study of scriptures, and sacred sermons. In a more secular way, this would be more like um, Carl Jung's like study of the archetypes and how they relate and correlate. Um, and then we have the uh, immediate uh, knowledge, direct apprehension of the object where no sensorial apparatus has no function. So like we said earlier, um, they believe they had um, knowledge re reveals itself as the subject that is known, which simultaneously reveals you as the knower. Um, you as the knower specifically the soul it has it's it's beyond the material body so um when you have direct apprehension of the object where no like bodily function no sensorial apparatus is is mediating this is immediate this is no mediation in between the knowing and the knower that's what this means. So, because soul's nature is knowledge, it needs no external assistance to know. Pure intuition is a, an example of this, and it's very hard to find, like, pure intuition. A lot of intuition is, is actually more so, um, probably unconscious, uh, sutta. Um, so limited supernatural knowledge, such as clairvoyance, um, this might be like the oracle in the matrix, possibly, I, I believe you might have higher knowledge, or if I'm, yeah, it doesn't really matter. Um, and then we have knowledge of other people's thoughts, aka telepathy, which is no longer available these days. Like I said, we're not really getting into, um, their cosmology and their ideas of, like, world history and stuff. That's probably best saved for another video. Um, and then there's this one, which I think most most people would understand. Uh, absolute knowledge or omniscient. Um, infinite awareness of all substances, along with their qualities and modifications. Mo ugh, modifications. So, yeah, substances and qualities. We'll be getting into those two. Um, this type of knowledge is only accessible to omniscient beings kind of makes sense like you have to be omniscient to have omniscient knowledge um interesting to note that um <clears throat> james believe that uh omniscient beings are gone from among us in this day and age but like i said we're not getting into that today so <clears throat> ultimately james describe reality as this. What exists is formed by a series of substances or dravyas, the substratum underlying everything. <clears throat> so substance, existence, and reality are all synonymous. Um, so we have the substance at the bottom, which is subdivided into two categories. The jiva, the animate substance, and then the ajiva, the non-animate substance. And then Ajiva is further subdivided into um, five categories. Matter, space, time, movement, and rest. Um, so substances themselves are eternal, existing by their own nature. Um, so on a substantial level, reality is essentially permanent. And we'll get more into what I mean by that. Um, Subsystems also, however, compose the substratum of their own qualities and modifications. Basically, this means um, matter doesn't exist unless it has a certain quality. And, like, there's no such thing as, like, a vague, like, just a, a, a piece of matter. Pure matter. <laughs> uh, and we'll get into that as well. At a modal level, reality is essentially impermanent. Um, so when Mahavira, uh, or sorry, when Gautama asked Mahavira about the permanence or the impermanence of soul, Mahavira said, beings in general are eternal from the material point of view. Uh, talking about not, not material as an atomistic, 
material minds are like some substantial point of view. Um, but however, they are not eternal in respect to their conditions, modifications, and um, sounds weird, but we're going to get into it. Um, this this whole thing kind of describes um, um, Buddhism's take on it would kind of be like um, non not non-existence non-duality or something like that yeah closely related to that but this one's a little bit more in depth so um, this idea is there is there is an essential basic or underlying substance which possesses series of qualities that are constantly undergoing modification there is no substance without qualities, no qualities without substance. The universe is eternal, but not static. The universal exists, but so does the particular. The cosmos is constantly changing owing to the origination, destruction, and permanence of the qualities and modifications of these substances. So the substances um, <clears throat> are eternal. However, they, 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 they have qualities and modifications which are constantly originating, destructing, and um, sticking around. So, um, if you want to go back to uh, talking about the soul... Um, so the soul is eternal because it's made of um, a substance that has a soul. But your particular soul has conditions like it being um, existing now or it being alive right now. And just because it might be dead later doesn't mean that the substance itself doesn't exist. If that makes sense. The, the, sub, the underlying essential substance of you is eternal. <sighs> so to describe these differences, we'll go into, um, we've got four, four examples. We'll start with the atom. Um, so an atom itself is a portion of matter. Um, matter is indestructible or um, cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be transferred into energy and back into matter. Um, so on, on some fundamental level, a, a, a single atom is permanent. Uh, however, its qualities are impermanent. A, a specific atom, what defines the, what's specifies this atom from all the other atoms. What makes this particular atom particular is its qualities, which are impermanent. Uh, so things like um, the number of electrons that it has, the number of neutrons that it has, where it is, its location, its... its um, speed, it's thermal energy, things like that. Um, so, it's kind of hard to explain. Like, you, you, you get it though? Whatever. Uh, then we have the clay pot. Um, this is a story about, um, so you have a, a your material, just like the clay mud. Um, and then a potter comes around and shapes it into a pot and burns it in the kiln. Um, so there is one perspective uh, where they say that since the pot previously existed in the clay, there is no modification whatsoever. So like the pot itself is eternal because it's always it's always it had the pot potential to be there, and because it is in existence now, it is. Um, so there's that idea. Uh, however, um, Buddhists, I, I want to say, are closer to the idea that um, there is no pot or clay. There is no. There's nothing eternal. Everything is um, 
change. Change is eternal. So they say that the transformation is what's um, what exists. Um, James, however, uh, all this idea of um, permanence and impermanence, um, <clears throat> whether or not these things are Uh, describing these things in these certain ways, uh, they're pretty much abstractions to James because they see it from both ways. Um, we have a more um, Western perspective. I think you've heard of Theseus' ship. So this is the idea of um, Theseus' ship where every year it needs repairs so you replace old boards with new boards. Um, uh, piece by piece, all, all along, and then eventually, um, like a hundred years in the future, or thirty years in the future, or whatever, um, Theseus' the ship is entirely comprised of brand new pieces. The new pieces in this new ship are, none of those pieces were part of the old ship. So is it the same ship, or is it an entirely different ship? Um, James would say it doesn't matter either way, like it, it, the process, all of it, like <clears throat> it's, it's just abstraction, like trying to, trying to define it as either way isn't really that, um, doesn't really matter. Um, then you also have this idea of the book as well. So you have a specific book that has a title, it has a cover. And it has a certain number of pages and everything. Um, and like you, you, you know that, and then you, you, you assume, okay. Mm. You. How do I, how do I explain this? You know this, um, think of like, um, Plato's, Plato's um, ideal forms. So like there is this ideal form of a book, a book in your head. And you know this book matches that ideal form because it has a cover, it has pages, it has words, it's a book. You understand that. But then it gets a little dicey when you start talking about things like, well, what about if you're writing a book? Um and you're writing it on your computer, and all it is is digital. Uh, and it's incomplete. Um, well, in some, in some respects, you can still call that a book. Most people would say you can't, but um, to Jane's, again, to Jane's, it doesn't really matter. Like, the, I, you can see it from all these different perspectives. And no particular perspective is... Um, is um, uh, holds more emphasis than the other ones to James. Um, so yeah, um, James believes since there are stacks of different qualities and their modifications are virtually numberless, like I said, um, the, the thesis of ship can be built with millions of different pieces. It can be, they can add different kinds of wood, all this and that. Is it still going to be the same ship? Um, so no one, no one can completely grasp what exists. Um, there are too many variables. We can only choose one angle of vision, and this will always be partial and relative. You can only set yourself, give yourself a position and a perspective. Let me go ahead and draw that. You can only set yourself in a position and a perspective. We will always be limited because there will always be this outside review. Go ahead and erase that. Um, whatever judgment we formulate is incomplete owing to our condition of bondage to this world. It can be valid for worldly activities, but in no sense can it embrace the enormous complexity of reality. At a given moment, one may perceive the unity of a substance, 
saying um, this is more so like, um, oh, everything is always one, oh, or the multiplicity of its modifications. Um, this is more so the idea that everything is transformation, everything is change, but you can't really see both at the same time, supposedly, according to this book. Um, only omniscient beings can simultaneously recapture the permanent and temporal in reality. <sighs> that's why, that's why these are really, um, hard things to grasp, or hard things to explain, I should say. Um, so we get to, uh, the first idea that James has about this kind of, like, um, identity indifference, non-duality, or duality, um, uh, meaning not echo one onto the side about a statement. So it's, uh, not a one-sided statement. The anekantika, the person who recognizes multiple aspects of reality, cannot make absolute affirmations. I think this is probably really important to say you cannot make absolute affirmations. The man who says he knows what the Tao is does not know the Tao or something like that. <laughs> I forget the exact words. <laughs> um, so they actually believe truth can be reached through different approaches. Not one approach holds monopoly on truth. Every philosophical system, when taken to its absolute term, becomes erroneous, reducing its vision of reality to one single aspect. Um, I'm going to go ahead and bring up, uh, like, nihilism. Uh, that I'm going to kind of uh, bring it up later, I think, but I think it fits right here as well. Um, so, uh, nihilism, like, uh, first of all, every, every philosophical viewpoint is true from some perspective. Um... The error lies in, uh, the error lies in, um, believing that it's the only truth or that's the, that it's the ultimate truth. Um, so if you, if you think that nihilism is, is the ultimate truth, like eventually you, it's, it's, it's erroneous. That's not, that's not how it is any perspective that you supplant to that um, any perspective you supplant if you try to like I said if you ha only have this field of vision and you can only look at reality and object in a certain way um, unless you're accepting of other perspectives to see what's going on you, and you're only looking at it from this perspective and saying this is the truth. You're not really, you're not really looking at the truth. You just aren't. Uh, Jesus, what? Um, so yeah. Um, James accepts slices of truth from other systems. Every, every, every perspective has a, has a piece of truth. Um, but they subordinate this to an inferior position within their own order of truth, which is this, like, multiple perspective idea. Um, Harib, Harib Hadra explains it as the other is right, but only partly so, the other being pretty much any other perspective. Um, uh, Hari Bhadra is also the one who says that the ultimate truth transcending all states of worldly existence and called Nirvana is essentially necessarily one, even if it be designated by different names. So things like Nirvana, Mukti, Kavaya, Moksha, Extinction, Liberation, Solitude, Emancipation. Um, Abrahamic religions, this idea would be heaven um, or... Um, Going into like new age spirituality is the um like coming and being coming into oneness with the cosmic cosmic consciousness or whatever you want to call it um essentially these are all the same things according to James 
um, Hired Hodge specifically also minimized differences between the concept of God, nature, void, non-duality, all these ideas of like, again, oneness and stuff like that. Um, and like, again, they, they were more concerned with the meaning, not necessarily with names and forms. So that what, what's important to them is that you had the objective, you knew what you were going for, and um, um, you were able to look at these other systems and notice that, yeah, they might have different names for what you might originally call heaven, but um, they're going to have pieces of truth in, in them. Um, even if they don't necessarily believe in all of the same concepts that you do. Uh, so Haribhadra, coming from uh, Jainism, well, also like Buddhism and those religions, um, which originally had objections to um, worshipping God in the way that Westerners do. Uh, Haribhadra said that uh, he saw no objection to considering God as a creator for the benefit of devotion. Um, so yeah. Funny. Okay, so yeah, uh, we're good. So we're gonna be comparing Vedanta and Buddhism. Um, so, uh, again, I'm not gonna um, claim any veracity on this text. Um, so I don't know if this is actually what Vedantins believe, or this is actually what Buddhists believe, or if it's just a specific sect or anything like that. What matters is these are just compare and contrast as to how Jains would respond to different perspectives. Um, so Vedanta would be more so the people who say all is one. Um, so you have their their idea of being is unitary and non-dual there is no change within it all it is all happening at the same time or something like that <laughs> um that which is absolute is eternal and does not modify or change the change that we experience is only illusion any suggestion of multiplicity is illusion um james would call this eternalism um, they per they only perceive the substantial aspect, only perceive the substance and not its qualities, and how the qualities change. Substance doesn't, the qualities do. Um, they also say that substance is inseparable, inseparable from production, maintenance, and destruction, because production is a quality. This is this is my, I don't know if this is extends as far as. It does, but um, my conjecture is that you have the substance like your soul, and like it exists or it doesn't exist. Um, like it's alive now, but it might you might like die in the future. What happens to your soul? Oh, that's whatever. Um, but um, even if it like quote unquote doesn't exist in the future, the underlying substance there has to be something there. originally for you to be able to say it does not exist now if that makes sense um <clears throat> so the quality of existing is um um kind of like presupposes the 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 permanence of the substance under underneath it. If that makes sense. Like if for something to exist now, like there has to be something and the underlying substance to apply the quality of existence to. And that underlying substance is eternal. I hope I've like <laughs> not confused you. Um, tried to explain that as best as I could. I think that's the best way to say it. Um, so yeah. Uh, substance, the, these people who think, uh, 
only substance is what exists and what we consider is illusion um, make this error. If there were but one soul common to all beings, they could not be known from another, nor could they experience different lots. You have in your mind made equal both those who lead a blameable life and those who in this world practice right conduct. Friend, you are deluded. Um, so, in their opinion, uh, the Donatons are incapable of showing path to liberation because they're unable to explain the nature of bondage or differentiate between worthy and unworthy conduct. Again, um, this goes back to um, their ultimate uh, goal is liberation. And um, knowledge, the only value in knowledge is whether, and the only value in knowledge or perspective, uh, this perspective would be um, to help you differentiate between whether and whether they conduct. Help you differentiate between what's good and what's bad and what you need to do and what you need to avoid. And because this perspective is too, like all other perspectives, too um, limited, it doesn't show all of um, all of what you need. So there's there's some value in in this in this um, perspective, but to completely ascribe to it, to completely um, put all your chips in one basket, that's yeah, um, not probably not a good idea. Buddhism, on the other end of the token, um, they deny the reality of substance, and they only accept modifications because they think that all that exists is change. Existence never ceases because they look at existence never ceases to change. So change is all there is, right? Um, there's only impermanence. Uh, Jains believe this is called annihilationism. They're un unable to explain in a logically valid way the state of bondage or liberation again. Everything is change. If the one in samsara is non-existence or is in fact only here a moment at a time, then the liberated one is not liberated. So it, it's, it's, it's a good perspective. You can get a lot of things from this perspective as well. But ultimately, if you completely ascribe to it, you, whatever like goal of going to heaven in, in your mind isn't going to be permanent. So how is it going to, <laughs> how is it going to liberate you? Um, so this is this is where we get to the meat, the the meat of the argument. Um, this is definitely uh, what you need to look at right here. Uh, actually, I got ahead of myself. It's it's the next one. This one's really good too. Um, so they they believe that uh, James have uh, believe in perspectivism. So yeah, they um, don't ascribe to any. Per particular perspective and these are the uh, seven most common ones that they do um, accept so there's the common sense standpoint in which no differences are observed between general and specific qualities um, so if we go back to the idea of the book um, so no differences are observed between general and specific qualities so you look at a specific book with like a green cover um, it has a specific title and you think this is a book yeah a book to you in that moment it is a book um, you don't really ascribe any like you don't say this is a specific book or at least in in this hypothetical in your mind in this perspective there is no difference. It doesn't matter. It's common sense. You know, why worry? Why why trouble yourself about what is about that? Um, so the perspective is a practical standpoint that you consider the object as practical experience and its specific qualities. Um, so instead of saying, hand me, or instead of saying, look at, I need a book. This would be more like, um, This, these would be the types of people who would say that the, the half-written book on somebody's computer is not a book. Uh, because practically, it's a saved file, it's a Word document, it's not a book. A book 
uh, has specific qualities, like a cover, like pages and stuff like that. Um, you can't just go to the general qualities and say, oh, well, it's it's incomplete, but it's it, it, it has words and this and that, and it could, it is, you can call it a book. No, they practically, no, it's not a book. And then you have the general standpoint, in which you take into account the object's general qualities. These are the people who say, yes, that, that half-written book on the computer, on the Word document, is a book. Um, then you have the manifest standpoint. They only consider the present. Um, so these are people who are saying um, there is no such thing as a general book. There is no such thing as a book. There is only this specific book in the in this moment. I think it's somewhat related to the practical standpoint, but it's it's more so like the they they more so focus on the present the present itself. And then these next three, five, six, and seven are more like linguistic perspectives. Um, so you have the verbal standpoint, they consider the relationship between word and object and its conventional meaning. So you have the book. Um, from a, uh, These would kind of be like the practicalists. Uh, so they, in the, the conventional meaning of what a book is probably wouldn't fit in line with uh, a word document on a computer. And then there's the meaning standpoint. They consider only the conformity of the word with the function of the object. So the function of a book would be um, a bunch of words with it, or a, a, a basically a, 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 a tome of information. Um, so they would consider uh, the um, word document a book. And there's the etym etymological standpoint, which is the, the meaning or the, uh, the word origin. Um, these are people who would look up what what language the word book comes from and where it's derived and like stuff like that. Um, so these are only seven of the most common perspectives that James is ascribed to. Um, um, <clears throat> hypothetically, there's supposedly like infinite, virtually infinite number of perspectives. Um, so, according to James, all these perspectives, all propositions are true, but only under certain conditions. So everything I just said about the book, whether it is a book or whether that document isn't a book, they are true, but only under certain conditions. Every single one of those. Um, the error of absolutism is in establishing that only one possible naya or perspective is true. Um, from the moment an observation becomes absolute and excludes the rest, it is erroneous. So go back to that list. From the moment any one of these, you try to say any one of these is absolute, truth, T, with a capital T, it's, it's an erroneous uh, standpoint. Not because... Not because any of these standpoints are erroneous in and of themselves, but because you try to establish it as the truth. It's not it's not the perspective that makes it the error, it's the absoluteness that makes it erroneous. Um, a judgment can only be completely valid if it pervades all of these perspectives and the point of view in multiple forms. So this would kind of be like the omniscient. The idea of omniscience, and omniscient being would understand all of these and the infinite perspectives that there are at the same time. <sighs> so finally we get to, this is, this is the meat and potatoes of it all. This is what actually, this is what I've been trying to get to. Um, see Advada, the doctrine of qualified asservations. Um, an asservation is only correct when it is qualified by the indeclinable notions, perhaps in a certain sense, in context, seen under certain conditions, and in fact, certainly. So there's two separate parts. So it has to be qualified by any of these statements, perhaps in a certain sense, in context, seen in these certain conditions. And it has to be 
uh, qualified it with these two statements as well. Um, so we take the, the example, the soul is eternal. Um, if we go back, remember he said, um, it is eternal in respect to its material point of view, but not in respect to its conditions. Um, so, uh, using this doctrine, this is how you would say this, and perhaps in a certain sense, in this case, opting for the substance instead of the modes, the first, the, um, the qualities that change, the soul is in fact eternal. You could also say, perhaps in a certain sense, opting for the modes instead of substance, the soul is in fact not eternal. Um, so using this, all paths can be valid in a certain sense. If you understand, like, in a certain sense, the soul is in fact not eternal. Even false doctrines can lead to supreme reality. And again, um, Jane's ultimate, um, use for knowledge is how it helps you, um, progress spiritually. So, perhaps in a certain sense, the soul is in fact eternal. The certain sense that Jains are most concerned with is the one that helps you to grow spiritually. So, if you, if you see the soul as eternal and it helps you to grow spiritually, then in that certain sense, the soul is in fact eternal. Um, if you find a certain sense where you see the soul as not eternal and it helps you to grow spiritually, then that, because it helps you to grow spiritually, that certain sense is in fact true. It, it doesn't, it's very particular. It, it's, um, so it doesn't actually have to do, it doesn't necessarily have to do with reality. It's not about, in this certain sense, the soul is in fact eternal. It's not about um, where to find out how this is true. It's um, it's not about how it's true. It's about how it helps you to grow spiritually that makes it true. So even false doctrines can lead to supreme reality if they're qualified by the term siat, capable of destroying the venom and the absolutism. So in this sense, you could see... Um, I'll do this one because I think this one's the easiest. The soul is in fact eternal. So if you have this idea that the soul is eternal and you're kind of like, oh, it doesn't matter or um, nothing matters, YOLO. Um, and you actually like start like harming yourself spiritually by doing certain things that you wouldn't do under like a different perspective. Um then using this tool, you can see that, okay, these things are harming me. So maybe in this certain sense, I shouldn't believe in this because it's only bringing me spiritual harm. And that's, that's kind of how I want you to start like looking at this tool is um, how, again, just like the James, like how it helps you to grow spiritually. So if some, if you, if you have this belief and in a certain sense, this belief is causing you to act or behave or think in a certain way that's harmful to yourself and to others. And you should take another look at it and apply this. Apply this and say, uh, perhaps in a certain sense, this isn't true and maybe I should stop believing in it. Mm, not entirely. Because, like I said, everything is true from a uh, certain sense <laughs> uh so we're gonna get into this this the sevens um <clears throat> the seven uh, parallelogisms so perhaps in a certain sense this thing in fact does exist perhaps in a certain sense this thing in fact does not exist Perhaps in a certain sense, this thing in fact exists, but in another sense, it did not or will not exist. Uh, the past or future example. Um, perhaps in a certain sense, this thing is in fact inexpressible. 
in in which case how can something be and not be so this is kind of like a, a combination of these two well this one is a combination of these two this one is like both of these at the same time how can something exist and not exist <clears throat> then you have um perhaps in a certain sense it does exist but it's indescribable how it exists perhaps in a certain sense this thing in fact does not exist and it is indescribable perhaps in a certain sense this thing is in fact exists and does not exist and is it indescribable so just like the seven ones from earlier these ones are also hypothetically um there could be infinite number of um um number of these perspectives but essentially um what you want to do with this is understand that um, everything, everything, everything applies to this. Everything in a certain sense exists. Everything in a certain sense does not exist. Everything in a certain sense in fact exists, but it may not or will not or somehow does not exist as well. Everything in a certain sense is inexpressible. Everything. Um... And then and another important thing to note is, um, again, to remind you that James are very practical with everything. They, um, things only, what, what they say think, um, exists or how true something may be depends on how, how much it benefits you spiritually. Um, so, um, as much as like, uh, um, it's it's they're not what they're not saying is that all of these views are equal like uh, perhaps in a certain sense this thing exists and like and all these other ways are true but perhaps in, um this perspective is probably the one that's most true um and that's what james wants uh it's like you want the perspective that um, enables the belief to allow you to flourish. So if you have this belief that, um, like a like a typical um, like a typical conspiracy theorist truther. Um, who like took the fear sauce and they're just running around with these ideas that um oh the world that the entire world is out to get you and they're absolutely like feared feared from it and it it it, it prevents them from doing anything if they look at it from these perspectives and find that um in a certain sense like maybe maybe the world is controlled by these beings but like in a certain sense like you spiritually spiritually um you have providence over your own over your own soul um materially another good way to look at it is like um the government uh, um it's a you have this idea of the government that looms over you and like controls everything and whatnot and spies on you and this and that but essentially when you get right down to it a vast majority of the people um probably have no direct interaction with the government other than maybe going to the DMV once a year to update their um, license or registration or whatever. That's about the furthest, like, actual direct um, interaction you have with this government that supposedly controls everything and sends you all this fear. But if you have the perspective, or perhaps in a certain sense, it doesn't actually do that. Um, that that's where the power of of this system lies is is being able to to evaluate um, being able to evaluate your thoughts um, yeah that's 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 essentially what um what i what I've been trying to get at this whole time this is this is where this is where you can think um any thought and actually evaluate it and see like okay 
does this perspective actually give me like spiritual growth is this is this enabling me ennobling me to grow and develop or is this just giving me fear or is this just giving me anger or is this just giving me uh envy these thoughts these beliefs um so in conclusion uh jainism does seek to answer the fundamental question of what is for the goal of achieving liberating metaphysical knowledge that is their ultimate goal is um they they want knowledge because it frees you because it liberates you um they want knowledge the type of knowledge that allows you to grow spiritually and get closer to this liberation they want the type of knowledge that allows you to know the difference between good and evil or good and bad or good um right action right conduct and wrong action wrong conduct um knowledge in and of itself is not valuable its value lies in how it allows us to grow spiritually knowledge at least the kind that's only available to us um we somewhat have intuition but it's not always correct or true um so all of our knowledge is limited in perspective and all of our knowledge everything you know or supposedly believe in can be erroneous um i think that's one thing that a lot of people don't realize is every single person in this world was born into this world um knowing absolutely nothing we are completely raised by other people who were born knowing absolutely nothing who were raised by other people who were born knowing absolutely nothing <sighs> do not underestimate um the possibility that anything you know can be wrong um and not just well let me okay not wrong like incorrect like from like a typical western perspective of like this idea that truth capital t truth exists in reality there is like a reality that is real um Jane saw reality more as like multi multi-layered multi perspective so like you can view reality as being real but you can also view reality as not um but again um anything uh, basically anything that's incorrect an incorrect view to a jane is not how close it is to reality it's how close it is to allowing your spirit to grow and that's kind of a weird way to look at it uh, at least from a western perspective um so yeah um, using Jane logic, one can prioritize and evaluate knowledge to free oneself from limiting beliefs such as fear, wrath, greed, etc. Um, and even if you can't exactly decipher how a limiting belief may be false, you can still take comfort in knowing that at least from some perspective, it is in fact false. So if you if you're plagued by this idea of like, oh you you you're like demonized by this or that, like from some perspective, like you have you you do have the sovereignty to like just um stand up and say no i don't i'm not <laughs> i do not allow these demons to uh control me um but yeah all right uh that was kind of a long video and i know it's been very late coming into it i think it goes without saying how busy or how hectic this year has been for everyone. <sighs> yeah, I'm, I really meant for this video to come out like months ago, but um, here it is. Um, yeah, so uh, I thought this was really important to bring out before, uh, like even before go diving into Carl Jung and um, American Gods, uh, Truth Drops and stuff like that. Um, Speaking of Carl Jung, uh, I'm, it's going to take a while for those videos to come out because I'm actually going back and reading. There's two specific books, Psychology of the Unconscious and Man and His Symbols, and I'm both going to read both. Um, I always recommend um, reading 
if you're if you're gonna dive into anything try to go back as far as you can and go to the original people so like um i i have read one or two books by joseph campbell um i've learned a lot of um about carl jung just like online on youtube but um nothing beats going to the original source so that's what i'm gonna do and i'm gonna try and dis decipher it and dissect it um here so yeah um but this concludes jainism 101 um i hope all of this was really good like i said it's only like half or maybe even a third of the information in one chapter which is only a couple pages in this entire book so um if you're interested i actually like um started reading more like uh, like the next chapter into it where they go into karma and all that and there is one passage that i wanted to read because i'm also watching um his dark materials on hbo uh it was from the old book series his golden or i'm um, sorry the golden compass if y'all ever read those books i forget uh the names of the other two but um basically there's this idea about the nature of sin um if you watch the tv show um they call it dust and funny enough i'm reading i'm reading about karma in this book and there's a passage that specifically says uh talks about the karmic matter um, that moves around freely throughout the entire universe as if it were interstellar dust this fine dust is indifferent and it only becomes a precise type of karma when it interacts with a spiritual monad when the soul acts, the surrounding karmic particles automatically infiltrate. This is what is called inflow. Um, <laughs> so if you if you if you're watching his dark materials, like that's the same idea of like dust coming in um, to the to the soul and attaching to the body. <sighs> so um, that's kind of an example of what a truth drop is. If you don't know what a truth drop is. Um, basically it's like any um like um pop culture like movie or something or even like a song or something like that referencing some type of like esoteric um truth like i said everything every truth or every perspective has some nugget of truth every every story has some like relation to reality um so yeah i thought that was really interesting um, but yeah, so this is Jainism 101. Uh, Jainism 102 uh, kind of gets into the nature of dualism, the reality of the soul and not soul, um, kind of dives into this idea of uh, matter, space, time, movement, rest, um, and the nature of karmic bondage. So that's, that's what I have in store next time. I think my very next video is probably going to be American Gods. Um, truth drops i'm just gonna pick out a couple I'm, i might do that as a live show just because it's it's gonna be more casual than this um just picking out um the uh passages and kind of my input on how they might be true uh so yeah that's that's the end of this video i hope i hope um hope you'll be able to use this knowledge to your to your um spiritual growth um y'all take it easy thank you